Hi, thanks so much for joining our webinar today. My name is Jesse Peterson. I am the Director of Education here at Sunray Construction Solutions. Sunray secures $10 billion annually for GCs, subs, and suppliers. We are a national construction document service. Today's webinar is conducted by the wonderful Chris Chris Grady, a Washington construction lien law expert. Today's webinar topic is don't sign a release unless it says this one thing. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the wonderful Chris Grady. Thank you, Jesse, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, again, my name is Chris Grady. I'm an attorney here. Uh, I'm located in Portland, Oregon, and I work in both Oregon and Washington. And I'm here today to talk to you about a few things. But before we get started, um, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, please feel free to go to the chat box on the right and we'll answer questions at the end. Uh, don't include names or company names in the questions. In our agenda today, we're going to talk about contracts, lien rights, bond rights, how to basically how do you get paid and how to secure your right to payment on a project. And that starts with a contract and how you draft your contract. Uh, Got to properly secure your, your lien rights and bond rights. We'll talk about lien and bond rules and exceptions. We'll talk about some lien law traps to avoid. We'll talk about how to exchange a release for a check during a project. And then Sunray's got some resources at the end for you. So first, the construction contract. And um, you know, so we're talking about lien and bond rights. Those are statutory creatures. They are very technical. They are very, you have to follow forms um, and, and you have to do things right, the right way or your lien rights can, or bond rights can disappear if you don't perfect them properly. Uh, but also what's kind of underlying all that is the construction contract. Because even if you properly handle how to set up your liens, you gotta have a good construction contract because those uh, that contract's going to determine whether or not you have a right to payment under the contract. So. The first thing to do if you're going to really properly secure these rights is to know your own contract. And I'm um, going to talk about some basics here. Um, uh, obviously, we're not in a, a contract seminar right now, but just some basics that you want to include in each one of your contracts. And obviously, depending on uh, who you are in a project, subcontractor, general contractor, material supplier, those parties are all going to have different kind of viewpoints, different needs, and different agendas and goals. But if you're seeking payment for construction work, whether you're a subcontractor, material supplier, or a general contractor, you wanna make sure you have this most basic information on your document. And each of you are gonna have different, uh, depending on where you are in the construction process, maybe you have different um, projects that you work on with the same contractor, and that contractor has a form you have to go through each time. Well, you, you wanna at least make sure you get some basics at the very minimum in these do contract documents, even if you don't have total control over that process. If you have control and you're able to negotiate your construction contracts, then you wanna spend some time and make sure you have a good contract in place and that uh, you don't have to redo this work on each project. Once you get the form down, then you're gonna plug in these, these things that we're talking about here, basic information that every construction contract should include. And that's the parties. You want to have the ownership, entity names, uh, who has authority to make and execute decisions, especially your own entity name. If you've, set, if you've taken the time to set up your business to protect you from individual liability for your business's work, then you want to make sure to put that entity name on that contract so that it's clear that the entity is contracting with the other party in your project. You want to have basic project information, which is a description of the project, the address, owner information, if it's not listed above, but the parties. You want to have basic price and payment terms. Is this a fixed price contract? Is it a cost plus with or without a guaranteed maximum price? Um, and what are the payment terms? You want to make sure to think about those. There are a couple of terms that you want to try to avoid if you're a subcontractor. Those are pay if paid clauses or pay when paid provisions in a contract. Those may be enforceable in Washington if it's set up properly. And if you're a subcontractor and uh, you uh, have a, a contract executed with the general and it's set up well on behalf of the general and there is a pay if paid or pay when paid provision in there, if the owner doesn't pay, the general contractor can just sit on that. Even if you've done your job right, you've done everything right on your part of the project, you, you may not get paid. And they may have a good defense to your claim to payment 
if you have a pay if paid or pay when paid provision. You also want to include your schedule in there. It's very important because that's going to have, uh, you know, also a relationship to lean timing. So you want to have dates of commencement, substantial and final completion dates. Um, you want to have um, terms in there that talk address delays and remedies for delays and um, whether it's just time, time and money, time only or nothing and whose burden is it to prove delays as a subcontractor on a project. Uh, it seems that that is often a uh, something that the subcontractor encounters would be delays that are not its own fault. They get dragged along in a project and they if they don't have their contract set up right, they don't get paid for delays. You want to have your scope of work well defined, incredibly important. Um, you want to describe what work is being performed, labor, material, equipment, services, identify those things. You want to have a change order process in place and whether there are design build elements and who bears the costs of permits and inspections. So if you're going to, um, Excuse me. If you're going to make one change to some of the construction contracts out there that we run into in our practice uh, on behalf of, the, and we represent every party to a construction project, whether that's a, a material supplier, a subcontractor, a general contractor, an owner, a developer, a design professional, we, we've represented all of those parties in litigation and in contracting. So we kind of see uh, some of these disputes from each point of view in a project and and one thing if you're a subcontractor or a contractor especially if you're contracting with an owner oftentimes when you're uh in a contract with a property owner and or a general contractor if you're a sub there's going to be an attorney fee provision in your contract and it's going to read something like i have up on the screen here and in essence it says the prevailing party in a lawsuit gets to recover attorney fees from the losing party in the lawsuit and sometimes expert fees and other other costs as well. Um, if you're contracting with an owner, you want to consider deleting that provision. And that's because if you're a contractor, you have lien rights. If you if you set up your lien rights properly and you prosecute your lien rights properly in a litigation, you're able to recover attorney fees. And uh, so you, you might want to um, delete the attorney fee provision because once a project's finished and everyone's been paid, really this prevailing party fee in a contract is going to become an owner's weapon moving forward in a defect claim. And so if you strike that provision or make sure it's not in there and you do and you're not paid and you properly set up your claim, you're able to prosecute a claim and get attorney fees um, for your lien rights. So let's talk about securing your lien rights, and this applies to private projects. So what is a construction lien? It's complicated, but we're going to go through some basics. And I guess, and, and I think probably I'm guessing everybody on this webinar already knows this, but clearly there are a lot of pitfalls, and it's a very um, uh, pr process-oriented um, statute, and you got to do things correctly or you're going to lose your lien rights. So what is a construction lien? It's a security interest in real property, and it's available to a person or entity who provides labor, materials, equipment, or professional services for improvement of real property as part of a private construction project. Again, this is not public. If you do it correctly, a lien attaches to the property, which is typically the land and improvements, and has priority over some other types of debt that uh, happens on these projects, for example, some of the lenders. The ultimate remedy, if you properly set up your construction lien and prosecute your lien claim, is a forced judicial sale of the property with proceeds being used to pay the debt. And a prevailing party may have the right to attorney fees. And you've got to perfect your lien following all these onerous requirements, quite frankly, based on the type of project and claim under Washington law. And these lien laws are strictly construed and, and that means the court's going to look at these things, and, and if there's something wrong with it, with compliance of the statute, it might kick out your lien. And specifically, and especially, notice and timing are critical to preserving your lien rights. And also, a big point here is if you correctly uh, set up your lien rights, you may not need to hire a lawyer to prosecute your lien claim. Because if you're on a construction project, you properly set up your lien rights, and if your claim is not gigan a gigantic portion of the project, 
a general contractor that that knows its business is going to understand that you properly set up your lien rights and then you could probably negotiate or maybe negotiate a resolution on your own without ever having to contact a lawyer so properly setting up your construction lien rights will allow you to hire a lawyer who can help you recover your payments but actually hopefully you you won't actually have to even do that because again if these things are set up properly and you have a general contractor or an owner developer that's uh, savvy to what's going on on a project, they're going to understand that they're in trouble if they don't pay you. So uh, again, um, the type of project is private construction projects only. The type of contractor or supplier, uh, they must provide labor, materials, equipment, or professional services for the improvement of real property. And a lien's measured by the contract price for the work, which is another reason why you want to have a contract price in your contract and why your contract matters here, because you're going to be fighting over what is your contract, say, what's the deal, what is the price you're due for your work in order to recover your lien claim. And it's got to be work authorized by the owner. And this is for an improvement. And in most cases, a lot tract or parcel of land, which is improved. And we'll talk briefly, uh, just touch on securing your bond rights. And so lien, liens are not available on public projects. What uh, the law provides in its place are payment bonds. And for many public projects, most of them, the general contractor is going to secure a payment bond for the project. And that's in order to um, provide uh, security for the payment rights of suppliers and subcontractors. So who are claimants under a payment bond in a public project? Those are laborers, mechanics, and subcontractors and material suppliers and all persons who supply such persons or persons or subs with provisions and supplies for the carrying on of such work. Preclaim notices. Those are required for all potential bond claimants not directly contracting with the prime contractor except for laborers. This is complicated stuff. There seems to be exceptions all over the place. So there is a pre-claim process and that uh, claimant signs a written notice of claim and it's in a very specific form that's prescribed by statute and you have to follow it properly. Claimant presents and files a notice of claim with the correct recipient. So the statute even has different recipients available and you have to file it properly with the correct recipient. And then written notice must be filed within 30 days from and after completion of the contract with an acceptance of work by the affirmative action by the recipient. I think that, um, you know, th that can get complicated in and of itself, depending on the project and, and what specifically happened. Liens, uh, rules and exceptions. So uh, with respect to pre-claim notice requirements, uh, for example, and I can't cover everything in this webinar, but we're going to just briefly talk about a couple of things. Commercial projects, uh, pre-claim notices on commercial projects must be given by material or equipment suppliers who do not contract directly with the owner and subcontractors who do not contract directly with the prime contract. And then another type of project where there are pre-claim notice requirements that I'm going to talk about today are owner-occupied single-family residences. Pre-claim notices must be given by persons or entities who do not contract directly with the property owner, and there are exceptions. For example, persons whose claim is solely for labor and first-tier subs who contract directly with the prime contractor. Again, some complicated things here. Um, there is a pre-claim notice form and delivery requirement, and that is, again, uh, a specific form required by statute, and, and you can see the form uh, by going to the statute or Sunray. Um, you got to give notice uh, to the owner or reputed owner, and notice is given by, has to be given by certified or registered mail or personal service, and you have to follow all these things as prescribed by statute. If you don't, you may lose your lien right. Uh, just by failing to, for example, give notice by certified or registered mail or personal service. Pre-claim notice timing issues. Um, I, we'll just do a, a couple of different examples. Commercial projects. Uh, notice must be given within 60 days of starting work, supplying materials or supplying equipment. And that will preserve the lien right for all work done, materials supplied, and equipment furnished. 
later notice, you can do that, but it only provide, preserves part of the work, materials or equipment. So you want to be sure you're timely with your notice if preclaimed notice is required in your instance. For single family residences, and I broke that down into two different examples, one for new construction, notice must be given within 10 days of starting work, supplying materials or furnishing equipment, and that protects the right to uh, claim a lien. For an occupied single family residence, like a, for example, a remodel, an addition, something like that, notice uh, is given prior to the time the owner occupier pays the prime contractor and that protects the right to a claim, uh, a lien for such work. Uh, lien filing requirements. So uh, the other step, once you've done all, all of these prior steps and if you're going to try to preserve your right to a lien and you haven't been paid yet, then you need to record a lien. And there are, again, statutory lien filing requirements, and you must file your lien or record it within 90 days after you cease to furnish labor, equipment, or materials to the project, or the last date on which employee benefit contributions are due. I don't know how much that's going to apply to any of your folks, but that's a possibility. And um, I guess in, if you're going to use Sunray or an attorney, uh, go in early. Don't 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 go on day 90. Don't go on day 89. Um, what I recommend strongly is during a project, uh, mark your calendar, and mark your calendar um, from the very earliest day that anybody could argue you cease to furnish labor, material, or equipment. And that can be a fuzzy line sometimes, and you want to be very cautious and uh, start your 90-day calendar on, on your own system from the very first day you, anybody could possibly make that argument. And then I would recommend at least two weeks before uh, the 90 days, I would go get some help uh, and have somebody get the uh, lien filing work done for you so that you have, you're not on the 90th day trying to record this. Form and delivery of the lien claim. The statute provides a form of lien claim and states that a lien claim substantially following the statutory form shall be sufficient. Again, you got to follow the statute, it's got a form. After you file the lien, you got to provide a copy to the owner or reputed owner, and that copy has to be given by certified or registered mail or by personal service within 14 days of the time you record the lien. For the next step in the lien, uh, securing your lien rights would be then if you're still unpaid at this point, then uh, you're probably going to hire a lawyer at this point to foreclose the construction lien claim. And uh, they have strict deadlines as well. And a foreclosure action, the place you do it is going to be in superior court in whatever county the subject property is located in. And the subject property, of course, being the construction project. The foreclosure actions has to be filed within eight calendar months after the lien claim is recorded. Going into a lawyer's office, I would go into the lawyer's office no later than seven months. I would do it six months. You want to make sure that um, you give the law firm time to uh, evaluate your claim um, and then also get it ready for filing without having to rush to beat a deadline. So let's talk about a few lien law traps to avoid. You want to avoid preemptively waiving lien rights in the contract. Now, this isn't really common in Washington at this time, but some construction contracts ask the contractor, and the subcontractors usually get the brunt of the tough terms in these projects, to waive any rights it may have to a lien. And that's whether or not the general contractor gets paid. You want to try to avoid those as best you can because this is your tool. This is the best tool you can have is properly securing a lien uh, to get yourself paid on a project and to avoid having to litigate the, or, or go through a hiring an attorney. If you have everything secured properly and again, a savvy general contractor or developer, they're going to know this and you're going to get paid, assuming they can actually do it. Uh, you, again, want to avoid a pay if paid and pay when paid provision in a contract. And those, you know, are written in a way that says basically, again, if the if you're a subcontractor a contracting with the general contractor, the general contractor contracts with the owner or developer, if the general doesn't get paid, these provisions will say then you don't get paid. Or if the general uh, the, or if they're about timing of when payment is due, 
they could say, well, you don't get paid until the general gets paid. And if that's two years, then you're going to be potentially waiting two years yourself or fighting that with a lawyer and paying a lawyer to fight that for you. And trust me, those are the uh, provisions you do not want as a subcontractor in your contracts. So don't give up your lien rights in advance. That's the lesson here. If the one, one thing you take from this whole entire webinar. Again, there are uh, notice requirements. Um, so Washington strictly enforces notice provisions in contracts. So we go through all these lien, complicated lien uh, statutory processes and requirements. But also, if there's a any kind of notice requirement in your subcontract or your contract with the owner, then uh, and if you don't follow those notice requirements, which could be totally different than the lien requirements, then you may not recover. You may not be able to recover on your lien. So you want to also carefully follow those notice requirements in your contract. Another thing, you want to make sure you register as a contractor prior to entering into a contract. An unregistered contractor can't sue an owner to foreclose a lien claim. That may be different uh, from contractor to contractor disputes, but um, clearly you want to be registered as a contractor. It's a gross misdemeanor to perform construction without being registered, so uh, and you will get fined for that. Lots of different reasons to register. Make sure you're registered. So uh, let's talk about then the right way to exchange a release for a check. And, and I say right way, this is our, our recommendation. I, you know, there's, uh, there's always more than one way to do something. And there's uh, at times several different good ways to do something or poor ways. This is, this is one way to take a look at it and that you wanna pay attention to this phrase to the extent of payment. So let's talk about uh, project and payment and releases from the owner's view. And we'll, we'll go through other views as well, but we'll start with the owner because it helps to understand everybody's perspective so you can negotiate these things on a project. So really uh, from our position, when we represent owners, their main concerns are to make sure that the work's been properly and timely completed and for the price that the parties agreed to. Owners are often told to get a full release of any and all claims as of a certain date. And quite frankly, I, I may re make that recommendation to an owner client of mine if, if you're looking out for that particular entity's interest. But, you know, contractors, if I represented the contractor, I'd tell the contractor not to agree to that. So, um, you know, what owners really want to know is that they're not going to pay twice for the same work. And that can happen if the general has gone sideways, for example, for whatever reasons the sub has done its work. You've, the owner would have paid the general for the sub's work. The general doesn't pay the sub. The sub has lien rights. That's where the owner can feel like they would pay twice for the same work. Let's talk about the contractor and supplier views about payments, releases. So general contractor and, and the sub, they, they want to get paid. And they, a general wants to preserve pending and potential claims as much as they can. And they want to ensure that uh, subs and suppliers won't lean the project once each of those parties gets paid for obvious reasons. Um, and subcontractors or suppliers, obviously, they want to get paid too. And you want to preserve pending and potential claims to the extent possible. And that's very important from a sub point of view, especially if you're going to get a partial payment. You have some potential, cha you have change orders pending. They're not agreed to. Maybe there's a disagreement about scope change in work, all those things. So you want to make sure that you're not waiving your rights. And so here's an example. There are two different types of lien releases, conditional and unconditional lien releases. A conditional release is uh, made prior to getting paid. An unconditional release is made after payment's been received. Either way, a uh, lien release should be to the extent of payment and you don't wanna do a broad release of all claims as of a certain date. So uh, using the language to the extent of payment then is going to hopefully clearly communicate that you're releasing claims that you've been paid for and you're not releasing claims that are unpaid. You wanna ensure you have the right to make claims to the extent possible. You wanna list known claims and open change order requests and make those, uh, make those clear communications during a project, don't hold on to them. You want to pay attention to what's actually written on a check. And this is, um, you know, sometimes people play games on checks about what they're writing. And, you know, uh, we maybe you don't want to, it may not be enforceable if an owner writes payment in full when it's not on a check. Uh, or endorsee hereby waives any and all claims if they write that on a check. 
it may not work, but you probably want to just get rid of those things so you're not having to argue about what your intention was at the time you took that check. All right, and that's uh, that's what I have. I'm going to turn this back over to Jesse. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Chris. I really do appreciate it. You went over some really good information for us. Um, we do have a question that has come through. It says, what if I sign an unconditional release accidentally? Can I still have lien rights? Boy, that's a that that is a I, I I can't answer the question. I would say you probably want to go talk to a lawyer because that what did you release really, and then what can you do is going to depend on the contract and the release itself and the language in that release, and then what's going on in the project at that time. My recommendation would be to to consult with an attorney. All right, perfect. Uh, well, thank you. Make sure you guys keep that in mind. You pay attention to what you guys are signing before signing it. And if you have any questions, have an attorney um, review it for you. And that way you ensure that you're not signing something you don't want to be signing. Uh, that is all. the only question that has come through so far. If anyone does think of a question that wasn't addressed, please feel free to reach out and we'll be sure to answer any questions for you. Uh, Chris, can you go to the next slide for me, please? Sure. Thank you. All right, so here are some of Sunray's resources to help you stay organized, know your deadlines, and secure your lien rights. Go ahead and scan that QR code um, to access all of it. There's deadline calculators on there, project information sheets that are really wonderful to help get you the information right off the, you know, the jump of your project and know who who your customer is actually working for and, and all the pieces upstream from you. So that's really wonderful. Um, and then also remember each state has its own unique lien laws. So please, if you're working in a new state um, or a different state, check out what those lien laws are. You can look at it on our website to see, okay, this is a commercial project. I'm working as a supplier for this job. What do I need to do? And then we'll kind of break it down as to what documents are required and what those deadlines lines are associated with them. So please check it out. Uh, and then if you don't mind the next slide for me. All right, if you don't mind, give us a, a take a moment to review us on Google. We really appreciate it. Uh, we really do appreciate the feedback you can give us. It helps to get this information out to other contractors and suppliers like yourselves, as well as we want to hear what other topics you potentially want to hear um, webinar is about. So really, really, we would love it if you can go ahead and give us that review. Uh, and then the next slide. All right. And with that, that is all we have for you guys today. Thank you so much to everybody who attended. We hope to see you guys at our next webinar. Uh, Chris, again, I can't thank you enough. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful and beautiful sunny day. Thanks, everyone.